The history of a people is significant and important in understanding who they are. If you do not know where they are from, if you don't do not know what they've been through, it might often be difficult to understand why they do things the way they do. With the case of Com, this is very critical because of their dual succession system and the differences that take place in the tribe of Com. Welcome to the summon, the African summon, where we connect you to Africa and African culture. In today's edition, our guest is Professor P.K. Young. He is a man who has got a passion for his people, has grown up in his hometown, has experienced life at so many facets of being an African, and is more than happy to, to come and share with us, not just the history of his people, but his understanding of how this personally has influenced him and has molded him into the person that he is. And invite your friends, neighbors, and loved ones and join us for this life-changing conversation. While you're at it, do not forget to subscribe to our channel, like our video, and share. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for having me. Thank you. Prof, could you help tell us something about Cameroon, where you are from, or the tribe of Kam in particular? Um, I think I would uh, like to tell you a little bit more about Kam. I know you've heard a lot about Cameroon. I think uh, Kam is one of the tribes in the Northwest uh, region of Cameroon. And um, when we say Kam, uh, the language too is also called Kam as well. So we call it the Kam language. So we have come as a tribe and then come as a language. So that's one of the things that uh, I just want to point out. Um, we, we have uh, more than, I think, close to 150 villages that actually make up this tribe. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's very large. And if you think about um, the Northwest region, you will notice that there's quite, quite a, few, a few tribes uh, that um, most of them constitute what we call the Tika community. And so Com is one of the Tika communities that we had when, uh, uh, when they constituted the Western grass fields due to migration and all of that, which I think we're going to talk about in, in, some, in some form during this conversation. And then one thing I want to <clears throat> point out about Com is that um, it's, it's very unique in its way, um, in its ways, because uh, one of the most um, I would say a celebrated piece of art that was carved in 1865 by uh, our famous uh, von Yu the first actually put Com on the map and actually put Cameroon on the map. Um, it was somehow on will on uh, out of I don't know I, don't, I think it was stolen or against its will brought to the United States and in 19 uh, I think it got returned in 1973 which means that um, 50 years in 2023, we will be actually celebrating the 50th anniversary of the return. And when it went back to Cameroon um, in 1973, after being found in an art museum in New York, uh, that really generated a lot of news and Cameroon was known worldwide. And Com was actually known uh, worldwide as well during that time. So I think that's one of the things that really uh, put Com on the map. And then one of the things uh, that would come on the map is the uh, coffee farming. Uh, so the Com people uh, are known for coffee farming, mm -hmm. and and uh, the the coffee farming actually came to to Com in 1934 uh, by a famous uh, by a famous guy. I think uh, his name is Tadius. He came from one of the villages right next to our village. That's how I got to know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So the, that's one of the, uh, the things that generate income for a typical household in, uh, in, uh, in, com, in the Com tribe is coffee. And then uh, what, the, what the women do mostly is farm work. So that's uh, basically for consumption. So we do not have a lot of farms in Com that are meant to generate income like uh, as, a, as a business or in large quantities. So most of what is done 
it's just to, to consume at the family level. And then uh, COM is also well known, uh, according to oral history, it is said that COM defeated the Germans in a war and, <laughs> and they used very, um, they, they used methods that, you know, we can discuss as a separate topic. Uh, but COM is known to have defeated the Germans in the war and we are very proud of that when we talk about it. It's oral history, I wish there was much more written on it. But most of what I'm going to be discussing today would also be from uh, the work that uh, one of our, our guys did. Uh, we call him uh, uh, Sam Joseph. So he's published a little bit on some of what we will be talking about today in addition to the lessons that we grow up learning from our parents. So uh, being from COM um, is one of the things that really makes me, I feel like, uh, like one of, our, uh, one of my friends always says, it, it's, it's more of a feeling that you are from COM. It's not just because you are born there. So you get a special connection to this place. So Prof, uh, you, you make mention of being born and raised in COM. And I think that's something a lot of us have missed out on. Even though we're from Africa, we many of us were born and raised in the cities and do not really understand life in our hometowns, uh, what, what it's like growing there and the value of even being connected to cultural associations, to the administration of, of our tribes, to understanding the layout. Other, we see other people from our tribes, but do not, cannot picture their positioning in the, in the tribes in terms of the compound layouts and life there. Briefly, could you give us an, a, a little taste of what you, you enjoyed growing up in the village and how it was and how that has really molded you? Yes, that's a that's a really good question. I I was born and raised in Bobong. That's particularly the that's the village I come from, uh, within Com, and that's uh, uh, situated uh, in the Junicom subdivision, because uh, Com is actually a part of the Boyo division. If you look at the administrative setup of the Northwest region, so I I was born and raised in Com, and what um, what I can tell you is that. Um, uh, growing up, everything was naturally, just generally, uh, it, it, it was a routine, and it was a routine that you could predict. So um, typically in COM, you have all what we call compounds, which are like home state, uh, where you have your dad or, you know, it depends on how, on how many members of the family, how many wives he has. So it's built in such a way that you have several different uh, units that are connected. So that the dad lives in a separate, you know, uh, section of the compound, and then other family members live in other sections of the compound. So I'm one of the kids that started living. I, I, I moved away from my mom. Uh, so the mom, my mom, will be living in a separate apartment in the same compound as my dad. So I started living with, in my dad's apartment. That's uh, at about the age of four or five, somewhere in there. And so growing up for me would mean I get up in the morning, I kind of help my dad with chores, and then I go to my mom and I help her with chores. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if, if you get to the age of six, then you start to go to school. And it was always very exciting because you grow up uh, learning your mother tongue. That's the calm language. Mm -hmm. And then you are excited to go to school at the age of six so that you can learn the white man's language. Mm -hmm. So we, we get to sit in the evenings. Uh, growing up, we get to sit in the evening by the fireside and tell stories. And so we could get all kinds of folklore. And then we, we, we grew up where discipline. Discipline was a very big part. Uh, the, our parents believed that uh, discipline was what would get you successful in the future. And they used a scare, scare tactics in order to, get to discipline us. I mean, they would not like you to eat when you are laying in bed. So they will come up with theories to say, hey, if you are eating while laying in bed, uh, maybe when you have eventually get a child, the child will have a defect <laughs> or something like that. So they, that's, it's now that I kind of make sense out of those things, that that was a way for them to scare us and to get us to behave well. And uh, so typically, we would perform those chores. We will help our parents in the coffee 
processing and everything that uh, they had to do with it for when it is being marketed. And then um, we would normally go to church on Sunday. And then when, we, when it came to school time, we go to school, we come back home. It was a routine that we could literally predict. And then in Com, there is a lot of celebrations. Uh, we, we would have celebrations of death, and then we would have uh, celebrations of traditional marriages. So that actually characterizes our tribe. And our Com tradition really has specific ways that those celebrations have to, you know, have, have to be carried out. Yeah. So, so in, during those moments, during those celebrations, as kids, we get to learn a lot about our culture. We get to see what the elders do. And then also growing up for me, I was the kid that if dad was going to go visit, you know, uh, the palace or to go visit a friend, then I was the one that would hold his back or I would hold his, his umbrella and walk beside him. And so through those interactions, that's how I've really come to enjoy and admire the calm culture. And I feel that it helps, it, it, it helps that I really grew up that way because I feel like I'm not just learning it, I'm actually living it. It's something I'm just trying to uh, make sure I keep because when you don't practice it, it's just like, uh, so. Did you have, um pipe bone water or did you have to go to the stream did you have um refrigerator how did you guys preserve food <laughs> i wish we had a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had we didn't have pipe bone water uh we had to go to the stream to fetch water and that was one of the things that i didn't like if my mom started asking me to go fetch water at night uh so that yeah that was part of uh that was part of our routine uh, you have to fetch water. You have to fetch firewood for the mm -hmm. family. Yeah. So and then uh, uh, we had very little time, you know, to play. They, they kept us busy. And one of the things I like to say is uh, we live together in a homestay, but in a small village like that, you felt like you knew everybody. It, there was so much love among different families, and it was amazing to see that some parents really look at you as their own son or daughter. They would discipline you. If they find you somewhere doing something that they think was wrong, it, it, there was, it was not like a violation. You know, you don't want to discipline someone else's child. So there is that mentality that, you know, um, they just, uh, someone's child is when they're still in the womb. But once they, they're out, it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that they are well behaved. So that's how I saw, uh, I saw the, the village set up. It was set up so that, you know, uh, every, almost everybody knew everybody. And then there was love among families and people could discipline other kids, even when they were not BS. And it was okay. <laughs> and if I, if I may ask, how do you think things, how do you think things have changed? Do you go back to calm when you go, when you visit home and have things changed from the way they used to be while you go? A lot has changed. A lot has changed now with the, with the coming of the social media. Uh, people are a lot more exposed. There are things that we, we just used to sit and imagine. You know, we would have to, to find a road to, you know, to, 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 uh, to position ourselves there before we could see cars that would drive by. But now uh, we have a lot more roads that are you know, accessing some of the rural areas. So life has really changed. And then we have... Uh, my born water. Uh, we have had uh, a lot of uh, development associations. I mean, that uh, where people of a particular community come together to raise money to see if they can provide some of the social amenities for their community. So that has happened a lot. Uh, uh, that that unity in development uh, has really uh, brought a lot about a lot of change. And do you see this development enhancing culture or has it uh, taken away some of those values of, of unity, respect and discipline that existed um, in times past? I think for the most part, um, it has been largely maintained in terms of the culture. So the development has been, has been there uh, because some of the for take for instance some of the diseases that we face these days never used to exist in in those days 
So some adjustments and some slight changes in our cultural practices needed. Have, yeah, have, were needed. And so those changes have come along in order to make sure that um, uh, people live healthy lifestyles, but without completely crushing our cultural identity. So those are some of the things. Uh, th there's some meaningful changes. Um, so sometimes they, if, in those days, we used to have a lot of farmland. Uh, where people can, you know, grow their food. and But now, with the growth in population, I think the population of Com is about 170,000. So if you, want to, if you want to compare in those days where, you know, there were fewer people, then there was more land, then there was more food. So some cultural changes, uh, some changes in our culture have been put in place in order to take care of that particular population growth and then the shortage of land and then the fact that some of the land is no longer as fertile as it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so our traditional administration kind of relaxes some of the, the rules or some of the requirements. Uh, for instance, I'll give you one. There's one particular traditional right that used to be carried out with, uh, say, uh, uh, let me say, 10, we should call it 10 teens of, of corn. Uh, at some point, they reduced it uh, to to five, uh, which is really, uh, so if you used to carry, I think about 200 liters, 200 liters of corn, mm -hmm. now it's about, uh, it's about 100. So that, that is because of the changes. Uh, the farms no longer produce as much, and then things have become more expensive. We are a, a part of a global community. And so uh, there's, there's bound to be that change, but it is to a larger extent, very meaningful. Uh, some of it gets exaggerated, but our traditional administration has been uh, cracking down on, on some of those aspects as well. And Prof, I know that you, you realize I've completely been captivated by your, 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 your time um, and your, your origins in, in your tribe. And I'm trying to take advantage of that to kind of um, bring some um, understanding to the value of, of, of every African really connecting with their own tribe and with their own tribe and, and getting to understand the administration, getting to understand how things work in their hometowns because really most people get buried in these tribes and if in their lifetimes have never sp spent a day or a night in those uh, in that vicinity. So please help just enlighten us what's the value of of people really getting connected to their tribes and how does it really help them? Okay, I think it's very important to, to be connected to the tribe and to actually understand the, the history uh, so that we can avoid mistakes of the past. Uh, when, you, when you look at the way we grew up and some of the things that used to happen, being able to be connected and to learn about those things can really help us avoid some of the mistakes that were made at that time. So those who can't actually remember the past will will likely repeat it. So that's what that's what that's a common saying. And it is also important to have a, a way to maintain that identity. If you if you look at the way I'm kind of dressed up, you can tell that I am part of the Tika community. And you can also be more specific to tell that I'm from Com because there is a particular way that the, the outfit is made and it can even help to identify, to identify you. And then the type of food that we eat and can help to identify us as a community. And so I think it's very important to be able to, uh, to stay connected and to learn about our history, particularly the, the Com history in this case. Uh, for this particular reason, and I also, and I also think that um, uh, when we get connected to the tribe, we inspire a lot of those that are back there. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, when you learn about the, the the past, you can be inspired as to what you can do uh, for the future. Uh, there are some great men. There are some great men that did some great things in our tribe, like the guy that I hear from oral tradition, <laughs> from you know. This was not really written, but we hear stories that it was one guy who actually pulled the shot to shoot down the, the German general that you know caused us to win the war. And so when you hear about some greatness and you hear about 
uh, people in my tribe, like uh, Johnny Gong Fundo, like Bobby Chwasanga, like uh, Zikfu, and uh, all those names. I forget what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> so those uh, some people from Congo will understand that these great people inspire you when you hear their stories, when you hear what you do, and, and things like that. So um, there is there's, there's a lot of reasons, and particularly for me, it gives me that comfort. Uh, it just it just gives me that sense of uh, home when I <laughs> when I think about it and I and I reflect on how far we have come and uh, trying to imagine what it would be like uh, for my own children and things like that. So, Prof, would you mind walking us through um, the history of the calm people and the milestones and the significance of? Um of this history as it relates to their origin and where they are right now? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. A lot of the uh, core migration history is told uh, to make it seem like the Com people just came from Bambisi to where we finally settled. And that is not necessarily true because before Bambisi, uh, where did the Com people, you know, how did they find themselves there? Uh, so uh, as a matter of fact, based on what I've learned from oral uh, stories and things that uh, others have uh, tried to find out and written in books, um, the Com person actually originated from Egypt. And the Com people are part of the Tika community uh, where they were running away from Muslim subjugation and then fleeing down uh, to Sudan. To, uh, they, 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 they came to Sudan, then from Sudan, they finally went to the Adamawa region in Bankim. Then from Adamawa region, they continued down to Fumban, uh, particularly in Dobo, uh, where they settled there for a, a long time. And then eventually, uh, they moved to Bambisi, where almost everyone thinks that they, you know, they moved from there. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of uh, give it because back. background yeah, mm -hmm. of where we came from. And being part of the Tika community, you can see that there's, uh, there's a lot of similarities. We have these traditional institutions. Uh, we have the Queen for and other people have the Ngumba. And then the way we dress, it's a little bit uh, similar because of, we are part of the Tika community. The kind of food we eat uh, is along the same lines. Uh, but Com is a little bit unique in certain things as well. Uh, uh, while uh, in Bambisi, the leader of the Bambisi people uh, actually was very welcoming to the Com people, gave them a place to settle. And after a while, he noticed that the Com people were becoming a lot more populated. Uh, they were beginning to have a lot of strong men. And then every so often, a, a child was born. Every so often, a child was born in the Com community. And the leader of the Bambisi people became uncomfortable with that and decided to come up with a plan. So he actually told the leader of the Com people at the time, uh, his name his name is Mani. So he, he, he uh, told him that, you know what, uh, we are beginning to have a lot of strong strong men on both sides. Uh, how about we try to eliminate them for fear of the fact that they can take our thrones. Mm. So unfortunately, the, the, the com leader uh, agreed to this plan. And so the idea was that they were going to build two houses, one for the Bambisi people and the other one for the com people. And once they, 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 once they deceived the men to go into these houses, they were going to set it on fire and they will burn down all the strong men. And uh, that way, I mean, their leadership was guaranteed. They will continue to lead the people. But what happened was that the Bambi Sifon, or the leader, built his own uh, house, the house for his own people and had an outlet that was leading to the bushes. And since the calm leader didn't have an idea, he, he just built his own house with no outlet. And so when they moved into those, when the men moved into those houses, they were set on fire. The Bambi Sifon men could escape into the bushes and the common men were all burnt to ashes. And upon discovery that he was tricked by the Bambi Sifon, uh, the leader of the Com people was so frustrated, uh, expressed his anger at the leader of the Bambi Sif people, and actually even told him that he should know that the population of Bambi Sif will never 
be bigger than the population of Kong. That was that was a declaration he made at the time out of anger. And once he said that, he went back and then actually spoke to his sister. He spoke to his sister and then uh, told his sister he could no longer leave his people. He doesn't feel right. He feels that he has been used. He feels that he has been tricked to kill his own people. And he doesn't know how he could continue to leave. So he told his sister that he was going to commit suicide and that he should, she should keep an eye that she should keep an eye out for what could eventually happen. That if she commits suicide, um, the 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 liquid from his body will turn into water, and the the maggots that were gonna be created will turn into fish. That if I mean people who get in there to catch fish, the calm people should not be part of it. So that's the agenda that he arranged with the sister and then told her exactly what to do. And that after that, there will be a python trail. And that if a python trail appears, the calm people should follow that python trail and wherever it disappears, they settle. That's where they that's where, that, that will be their land. Wherever it, it disappears, that will be their land. If it reappears, they should keep going. And so that's what uh, should, uh, he told the sister. And after a while, a banshee hunter in the middle of the dry season. He had committed suicide. And a banshee hunter in the middle of the dry season found found a fish pond in the forest. And when they found it, when he found a fish pond, he reached to the banshee pond and told him about the discovery. The tradition was that the fish for the fawn will be the one that will be caught first. So the fawn, Bamisi fawn, actually came and sat there to supervise the harvest. And as soon as the Bamisi people got into the fish pond, the entire water, you know, I mean, they were all covered with water and they were drowned. Mm. And then after that, the python trail appeared. And the com people started following that python trail. The first uh, point where the Python trail disappeared was actually at uh, at in car in the car in the saw, and that is where it disappeared. And they settled there for some time. They thought that was where it was going to end, but after a while, it appeared again. So when it appeared again, they left. But this time, they were too scared of the forest, and you know they had to get help from someone in that tribe they call Tichicha. So Titicha was the one who would guide them through those thick forests. Yes. Yeah. And as they as they proceeded, uh the Python trail at some point disappeared. And it was this time it was at Idien. It was at a place called Idien. When it disappeared there, uh Nandong, who was uh the front the Mani's sister, who had the will, who literally, you know, was asked to take the calm people out of Banisi. Uh, so uh, the granddaughter fell in love with the chief of Indian, and she actually approved the marriage. So they got married and then delivered their first son. Mm-hmm. Once they delivered their first son, the great grandmother, or the Na- Na- Nandong, that's the name, Nandong now sang a song that meant that the person that was going to grow the Kong tribe has been born. That was the interpretation of the song that she sang. Okay. So now the chief of Idian was worried that that's my son. How can you be singing a song that is saying that this is the guy that is going to grow? How is that going to happen? What is your agenda? Mm-hmm. And so there was tension. There was friction at the time. And fortunately, the Python Trail reappeared. Mm-hmm. And the calm people had to leave. But they didn't leave with the grand daughter go with a grandchild okay so they loved them in their marriage and so the the granddaughter's name was Bo, and the name of the son that was born they named them they named him jin so and at the time when you uh at the time the naming system was such that uh you uh, your son's name or your daughter's name will be attached to your mother's name so so in that case it was jin Bo. So Bo is the mother's name. So and and uh, eventually we started calling uh, it Njina Bo. So that's the way it happened because um, 
that will eventually become the first phone of comp fast forward. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but how did it happen? So they proceeded, leaving, leaving Bo and, and her son mm-hmm. at that chief's palace in a foreign land. So the first form of com was not born in com actually. And they proceeded to another place, they call it Din, and then eventually they went to a, the, the Python trail disappeared at another place they call Ajum. And then while at Ajum, the great grandmother, Nandong, prepared some food and went back to check on the- The ch- daughter on, and the child. Exactly, the daughter and the child. And while she went back, when, when she actually went back, it, she was able to negotiate, to say, can, can we have the son come live with us at Ajung for a short while? And then fortunately, that agreement was arrived, and then she took that son to Ajum. While at Ajum, the son now was employed as a palace guard of Ajum, where the Python trail had disappeared. So they were there, and there were other people there as well. So. Uh, the, the son was even the, the great grandson was even employed to to be there as a palace guard. Then they lived there for a very long time, thinking that was the end. And all of a sudden, the Python Trail appeared again. So when the Python Trail appeared again, they moved to another location where it disappeared, and that was this time at Egypt. And when it disappeared, and they now moved from Ajum to Egypt. This same Nandong now decided to prepare food and go back to go check on the granddaughter at EDN. All right. This time when she went back, she realized that the granddaughter Bo had delivered a girl called Nange. And this time there was no negotiation. In the middle of the night, she took that girl child and disappeared. And okay. they came and met the rest of the family at Egypt. It is another long story as to what happened when this child was taken away, how the phone reacted and how the phone tried to chase them. It is a very beautiful story. Uh, but fast forward, fast forward when they came now and met the rest of the family, the Python trail eventually appeared again and ended up where the Com people settled today, which is at Lycom. We call that the, the Lycom and uh, it's where the Com palace is today. Now that was the final destination. From that time, I won't call it the final destination because what if the final trail appears again today? I was just and thinking. So this was so this was a journey that started in the 10th century mm. in Egypt, and by this time it is in the 18th century. That is actually 1830. So mm. it was in 1830 that the Com people finally arrived where they are today. Mm. And where that particular Python trail disappeared, a special house was erected on that spot. That house is there till today. It's a very special place. And it's believed that if the Python trail ever appears again, some people are going are to move. But it has never, it has not happened. Uh, actually, that means 2030 will make come 300 years where it is. It's current because location. They, because they settled there, I think that was 1830. That's where that's when that's when they settled where they are today. Yeah. Okay. And when they and when they arrived there, when they arrived there, they eventually split into three clans. And then one of the clans now became the one that was uh, uh, leading. So Jinabo, remember Jinabo, who was delivered at the end, now became the first form of come. The boy who was the guard the boy who was the guard uh, along the way, somewhere along the way, mm-hmm. and who was delivered in foreign land at the end. Mm-hmm. So he became the first one of Com. So guess what? What is his relationship with the original leader that committed suicide? His sister's grandson? So yes, yeah, so is the, so is the, we can say he's the great grand nephew, right? Correct. So he's the nephew, which is how we have our succession today. That is your nephew gets to succeed, right? Mm. So it's the from your sister, right? So from that your sister, came from, from yes, your sister. Right. So so those that succeed you are those that are delivered through your sister. Through your and sister. Yeah. So that 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 kind of that's the historical uh, precedence to uh, the historical reason for why we do have matrilineal succession today. Um, 
But then when they arrived there and they, they were able to split up into three clans, there's another big story as to how that happened. Uh, so we have the three royal clans, the Iqui, the Achaf, and the Itinala. Mm -hmm. So the Iqui clan was the one that would produce the leaders, the, the fawn, and then the Itinala and the Achaf will produce, will always provide the kingmakers. So all of them have a role to play in who becomes the fun of Kong. And that is actually how history makes us to follow matrilineal succession. So it is not some group of men that sat somewhere and decided that uh, this is how succession is going to work. History actually made it like that. In addition to the fact that it is assumed that only the mother really knows who the, you know, <laughs> who the father of their child is. And so the calm people believe that it's a lot safer to make sure that that family blood is the one that is ascending to the throne. And since you have the patrilineal and the matrilineal succession system, help us understand how those two systems, okay, so how does the patrilineal system come about? Now we understand how this, the matrilineal system, but why is the patrilineal system still there? And how, how do they how happen to up? even yes. working? Yes, yes. So what happens is that when Kong people arrived where they are currently located today, it wasn't empty. There were people there. Okay. So, and somehow they were eventually displaced. It's another long story. And then when the Kong people started fighting wars of expansion in order to capture more land and in order to gain more territory, if they, captured, uh, if they captured a particular set of people and they didn't want to leave, they could stay back and be under the calm traditional administration. Now, you could stay and then keep your own succession pattern. So if, if you are from, say, Kijem, or you are from a, a, you know, a different uh, uh, area, then you could stay under the calm rule and then maintain that particular uh, system of succession uh, from where you come. You know, and so, typically it was the patrilineal system. Yes, and then in some of those cases, it was patrilineal. Okay. And that, and then the calm people will respect. But if you come from Itinala clan, Achaf, those three royal clans, you must. it has to be, it you has to be what? Matrilineal. But if you come from any of the other clans that maybe entered calm, because uh, some some people fled into calm to take refuge due to wars. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you come into calm to find a place to hide. Eventually you settle, depending on where you come from, you are allowed to practice the patrilineal succession if that is what you had coming in. Okay. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Uh, that for, for instance, if the compound, uh, the, the, we call that compound a bear ball. That is where we, that is the, the, the font that. That particular compound follows patrilineal system of succession. Mm -hmm. And how it came about is that uh, there was a man and a woman. Um, there are conflicting stories that say, they were from a wing. Others say they were from uh, Kijem. And then they, they, they ran away from wars and came and hid themselves. They found refuge at the palace, at the Kong Palace. Mm -hmm. Then later on, the lady fell in love with uh, the, the, fun, the, the fun at the time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually uh, they delivered a son. And, you know, the, the son eventually got married to uh, someone in the royal family. And when that happened, remember, they, there was no family for that, for that guy in Kong at the time. So when he eventually passed away, he had only his children because his mom had come in from a different tribe. Okay. And so, but then he was able to deliver someone that would eventually become the farm. And so that particular compound today is being succeeded by children because of that history. So that's how patrilineal succession comes into place. If you need more clarification, you can ask, and then I'll I will go back to it. <laughs> so, um, in essence, if you could, you could you uh, have a patrilineal system, and at some point decide you want to switch to the matrilineal system, or um, how is it administered? Okay, these two systems. If 
as a matter of fact, by default, everybody will go matrilinear if you don't say anything. Okay. Because that's the default system of succession. And succession is at that nephew level, uh, which means that if you pass away, whoever comes in is just, uh, if you have a brother, the brother only comes in to be a caretaker. We call it actual succession when it now switches to the nephew coming in. All right. So if you are not from this three royal plant and you choose to say that this is the child that will eventually, you know, take over, then it is okay. It is, a, it is acceptable. That will be honored. But if you are, if you are, if you are from this royal, uh, three royal clans, it is going to be an impossible. It's going to be difficult because it is believed today that if that Python trail ever shows up, and we need to move. It is those three royal clans that are going to leave. Yes, are going to move. Uh, so by default, so you are you are allowed to decide uh, to some extent if you are not from those three royal clans. Got you. Yeah. Okay. So if if you decide to be matrilineal at any point, can you go back to a patrilineal system? I'm talking now about those who, who have the leeway to be patrilineal. Can you practice at some point the matrilineal system and jump back to patrilineal or is it's it... difficult? Okay. It's very difficult because first of all, if, if you're the one that has built your compound. Correct. You are the one that has built your compound and you have never succeeded someone else's compound. And then that's when you have that right to will your compound to whoever you want. But if you have become a successor, you cannot go succeed someone else's compound and then take yours and will it to your children. Thank Does you so sense? much for that clarification. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that is the key. You cannot participate both you cannot win both ways. You cannot be like, okay, let me take my own compound, and give it to someone and then go succeed. <laughs> no. So I have one, one last question I'd like to ha help us fully understand. What really is succession? When, they, when someone succeeds, do they, are they succeeding? Like you say, the compound is that, are those material things they are taking uh, possession of? Or um, is, it, is it responsibility they are taking on? Or what exactly is succession? That's a very good question because a lot of people uh, think succession is to come in and take just the property. No, it is actually a responsibility. And it is because the calm person believes that there is, it is a good idea to not increase the pain of any widow or to have, you know, to have a, a, a child that is living in pain because they don't have a dad. That's why they really like to make sure that the succession works. So when you are a successor, you are, yes, not only taking the property, you are taking responsibility. You are supposed to take care of the widow. You are supposed to provide their needs. You are supposed to send the children to school. You are not supposed to sell any of the properties without having a meeting with the widow and the children to decide together what is the purpose, what, what will it benefit the family trying to do that. Uh, so, so it's really more of a responsibility than just you know, taking over a property. And uh, the property here, the real succession here is looked at, we, we, we think that you're basically taking care of the grave of your uncle, right? So, so it's where your uncle is buried. That is where the succession, that's where the property, because if you have a, a place where your uncle is buried, and then maybe your uncle, before dying, had property somewhere else. He may decide to give the property somewhere else to his children. You know, he may decide to will that to different people. But then particularly where he is buried, that is where the nephew comes in and has control over. Uh, but if you, did not, if you did not give out any of the other property, wherever it is, that nephew has authority over it as well. Uh, so it's not it's not limited except you decided that okay this house that I have in the city or somewhere else belongs to my child or this and then this is where I'll be buried this is 
where I think my family can succeed and then make sure that my own children and my late my uh, and the widow is is in good hands. So and there is uh, there is a punishment. Uh, I think our traditional administration has ways to punish those that are violating the, the, this rule, but a lot of people don't know or they don't want to report it. So when they're being maltreated, they just complain and then blame it on the system, but they don't realize that uh, they have ways that you know they can get around and still be treated right. Uh, so, Professor, thank you so much. We have learned about calm. We have. We have explored its history. We have experienced life in calm through your eyes and through your experience. And we, you've walked us through the fascination of how the people walked and found themselves where they are right now. And with our past conversations on the matrilineal system and the the even marriage in calm, you you have just put the entire picture together for us, and we. We are very grateful and thankful, and um, hopefully you can come back and talk to us more about the naming, the naming, the value of the African name when you have time sometime. Yes, and then I wanted to make uh, one correction. I think um, the calm people settle where they are in 1730, because that was in the 18th century. We so, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, so it will be 300 years in 2030, I think, yeah. Okay. So do you have any yeah. final words for our audience? Oh, I, I really just want to thank you so much for bringing me to, to this your wonderful program. Um, I think anything that makes me talk about calm and my culture gets me excited. And uh, I'll be looking forward for more opportunities to come in and talk about anything that I think I might have a little bit uh, of knowledge on. So I really do appreciate you for having me on. We are most grateful, Prof. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you.